Awesome, thank you. Hey guys, we're going to go ahead. It's 6 o'clock. We're going to start this meeting. Uh, I'm going to call it to order. Uh, first thing on the agenda is uh, the approval of the agenda. Um, you guys had a time to look at it uh, over the last couple of days. Uh, do we have a motion to approve the agenda at hand? Move to approve. Okay. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. So we will go as scheduled with the agenda. Uh, the next is to approve the minutes uh, of the last meeting. Didn't have a meeting in September because we didn't have quorum. Uh, not an official meeting. Um, so the only ones we're approving are August 2nd, 2022, and we did get those as well in the packet. Um, motion to approve those minutes or? Like that motion. Okay. A second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, awesome. Cool. So now what we're going to do is uh, we're going to move into the public comment section. What the public comment section is, um, there were two sheets of paper over here. Um, one for this five minutes or so before the, the actual hearings start. And then there was a sign up sheet for the public hearings, which if you are specifically here to speak about the short term rental agenda item, um, the public hearing meeting was where you needed to be. However, with that being said, we are the town of Woodfin. We are inclusive. We are going to hear everybody because I know some people might have to leave as well. Um, so public comment, I'm going to go right down this sheet. Um, again, if it is about the short-term rental option coming later, feel free to, if I say your name, to hold it until that. If you need to leave, let's just go ahead and get your comment on record and we'll go from there. Everybody good with that? Awesome. Jason, I saw you walked in late. I don't know if you wanted to get on the list or not, but if so, you'll be the last one. Cool. Yeah. Um, so let's go with Sydney. Yeah, if you don't mind, come over here to the microphone. You, you, Please spot the light on you. Um, so mine is about the, the short-term rental yep. policy because I do have to leave early. So um, I just found out about this today. So I just read through all of this. Um, I actually am in zone R10 right now. Um, I just purchased a property about two months ago um, under the ability to be able to um, provide it as a short-term rental. I do actually also use it as my um, residence when I live here. I split um, my time between two states. Right now I work in two states. Um, and so what being a short-term rental owner allows me to do is have that stability of the finances to be able to have um, that income coming in when I'm not here. Um, so my concern is just having that taken away with me just, you know, purchasing this home about two months ago. Um, I pride myself, I don't allow, I'm reading through this and having restricted use, I'm totally fine with restricting, you know, prohibiting special events, having insurance, having to prove that I keep insurance on my property as it being a short-term rental. I'm also a local realtor in the area um, with lots are. And so, um, you know, I definitely um, take pride in that as an, as an owner. Um, and requiring, you know, limiting the number of permits. I'm not just some conglomerate that's coming in here buying 20 properties and driving up the values for people. I've seen that in my market, actually in Salt Lake City, Utah, is where I also live. Um, and so I've seen that come in and be a huge problem. Um, but as an individual owner, you know, I believe that that should be something that I should be able to have access to, especially with it being something where it's my housing as well. Um, so I just wanted to make that comment. So, thank you. so I want to add, um, uh, we didn't say it for you, but okay. please keep your comments to, is it three minutes? Yeah. Yeah. And I'll be timing you. Thank you. I was going to bring that up. Okay. She stayed, she stayed well under three Yes, minutes. she did. Yeah. Thanks, Sydney. <laughs> Shouldn't we clarify home stays? And uh, we're going to talk about them later. Uh, it's just comments. Matt. Sorry, I'll wait. You're going to wait? Okay. Um, is it Audrey? Audrey, I'll wait as Okay. Michael? Maloney? I'll wait. Okay. Gus? Um, I guess it will be on record. Yeah. It's still on record, yeah. So, I'll go ahead. Either way is on record. Yeah. <clears throat> My name is Gus Mojica, uh, 35 Cottage, local realtor as well. Um, just a couple questions. One would, would have been, um, what's the likely time frame that these things uh, will be in effect, or if anything does get enacted, like how quickly does that does that uh, become implemented? Just to get information on accurate information for people that are I'm working with. Um, do you guys have any ideas on that? 
to, to, to comment we'll just yeah. stick with the comment <laughs> all right what would and then uh, the other one uh, what would happen to the current short-term rentals as they stand whether they'll be grandfathered in and have some type of protection um, and uh, going forward so those are my two comments so we'll thanks Gus. thank you thanks Eleanor okay Nancy wait as well John Anderson we got a theme going <laughs> <laughs> Eric Tillman, you want to speak? I'll, I'll wait. You speak now? Okay. So awesome. So unless um does anybody have anything else they want to say that is in regards to public comment? What about your this guy? I'm good. I'm not fully prepared. I found out about this about two minutes ago. Okay. So. <laughs> cool. Hold off now. Perfect. Um so if nobody else has anything to say so there be another opportunity for public so there's a, a in the public hearing phase there's there's two different sections and in just a second I, what what will happen is I'll close the, the public comment section this, again this is just about anything in Woodfin it didn't have to be short-term rental when we get over to the public hearing um, Shannon's gonna come up and she's gonna explain how it's gonna take place but there's two items in the public hearing tonight there, there's one about sidewalks and subdivisions and then there is one about the short-term rental stuff when we get to the short-term rental stuff, there will also be a, a time for you to speak. Okay. Um, yeah, I'll give, give comments. Okay. Um, I'm a local realtor, and I, I manage a number of properties in Woodfin and around Buncombe County. And uh, with the Silver Line Plastic um, Park going up, uh, I have some clients that have properties adjacent to it that are wondering about sidewalks, especially going up like Woodfin Avenue. Um, so I just think that would be beneficial. There's a lot of people that go up and down that street that, you know, on occasion we've seen almost get hit. So uh, especially with that park going up, there's a lot more traffic. Yeah. So to clarify, your comments about sidewalks. Yes. On Woodfin yes. Avenue. Cool. Yeah. I love it. I'm a big I'm fan of sidewalks. <laughs> huge, huge. Cool. Well, with that being said, guys, I'm going to go ahead and, and close the public comment. So what we will do now is I'm going to invite Shannon up. She's going to kind of explain how this next little portion of the meeting will go, and, and we'll proceed from there. Thank you, Jerry. Um, good evening, everybody. My name is Shannon Tuck. I'm the town manager for the town of Woodfin. I'm also serving as the interim planning director, which is why I'm here tonight, the planning board. Um, we have, as Jay has mentioned, we have two public hearings on tonight's agenda. The first has to do with some amendments to the zoning and subdivision ordinance. We're going to tackle that first. The second item are, uh, uh, is a public hearing on proposed changes to the short-term rental ordinance. Um, public hearings allow for public comment. So we wanted to have the opportunity for members of the public to make comments. So we are conducting a public hearing. However, the first item we expect the, the planning board to vote and make a recommendation to our town council. The second item, we're not necessarily expecting a vote tonight. Um, this is an opportunity for, for input, um, for the planning board to kind of hear staff's recommendations on what kind of options that we could consider for short-term rental or regulation. But again, we're not necessarily um, moving forward with any changes this evening. Um, so there will be an opportunity for public comment, but I just want you to understand the expectation there will more than likely not be a vote. Unless the planning board is so motivated to do so, but I don't think that's not the expectation for this evening. So with that, I can go ahead and get started on the first public hearing item, which is a, uh, a series of text amendments. It's a grouping of text amendments to the subdivision and zoning ordinance. These are two separate chapters in the town's code of ordinances, chapter 46 for subdivision and 54 for zoning. And the reason we're doing these two together is because the, these are primarily a group of clarifications to our existing standards, with one exception that I'll point out when we get to it. Um, and because these are our two most substantive development chapters, you often see changes in both chapters. So when you make changes to one, you often end up having to make changes to the other. They often go together. And these clarifications have to do with new construction, and new construction applies both to subdivisions as well as um, general development. 
So to begin, we're proposing revisions <coughs> to um, two subsections of Chapter 46. That is uh, subsection 117, which has to do with lots and lot design, um, and then chapter or subsection 118, which has to do with streets and street design. So for lots, the main uh, clarifications that we're proposing is to to make clear that all subdivisions, which is a division of land that's for the purpose of sale and development, that all divisions, subdivisions, um, or the resulting lots shall abut a public road or a private road built to a public standard. Um, so this has been the town's practice. It is reflected in the code, this requirement. It's just not really clear. And so we want to make that super clear to anybody who's looking at the ordinance that that is the expectation. If you divide land, those resulting lots must abut a public road or a private road built to a public standard. The reason we require both private and public streets to meet that standard, that same standard, um, is it really, it's, it's about constructability and about safety. It's not about who maintains it. So it doesn't really matter if it's public or private maintenance. Emergency access, residents, everybody needs to access that road and rely on that road in the same capacity. We also find that even a lot of projects might start with private roads, but later when the developer is out of the picture and those individual homeowners are confronted with maintenance, they don't want to maintain it and they want to ask the town to maintain it. And the town is willing to do that, but it has to meet that standard. We're not going to accept a road that isn't built to a, um, you know, that has integrity to it. Um, and if residents find that their road doesn't meet that standard, it's, it is a tough pill to swallow that now they have to uh, invest significant money to upgrade the road and oftentimes it just results in them never moving forward with public um, dedication at all. So that's why we have uh, a requirement for public frontage and it doesn't matter if it's public or private maintenance. It still has the same standard that it has to comply with. We are offering one exception. So that road infrastructure and the requirement is to build to an NCDOT standard for a road. That is a fairly significant investment. That's a lot of capital to put up for that public infrastructure, road infrastructure. When you, and if you only have a few lots, it's probably not worth it. You're probably not going to subdivide because the cost of that infrastructure is not, it's just not gonna pencil out in the end. So um, we are offering an exception to that requirement that it abut a public street or private street built to public standard if it's only four lots. So if you are a residential um, development or commercial development, you can have up to four lots on a private driveway um, that's contained within a private easement or right of way. And the widths for that are less and we don't worry about the construction requirements. Um, so it's, uh, um, the, it really we only, did, we only uh, specify the width of the right of way or easement, which for residential would be 20 feet and for commercial would be 30 feet. Um, for those driveways that have lengths greater than 150 feet, uh, we require that they provide sufficient turnaround for emergency vehicle access. So that is the one exception to that lot standard. Um, we are also adding some clarifications regarding flag lots. Um, flag lots are not currently defined in the ordinance um, and it is something that uh, surveyors and other property owners have done in the town of Woodfin. Uh, the code is current up to date has been silent on this, how to treat flag lots. We recognize that flag lots are valuable when you're trying to just add maybe one lot. Um, they become more problematic if you try to create a lot of flag lots, particularly if it's part of the same subdivision. So we want to limit and control the number of flag lots and to try to control for some of the um, not so great consequences that often come with flag lots, such as driveways being sort of smack up next to each other. Um, so flag lots will be allowed, but they'll be limited with some requirements. Um, first, that no flag lot driveway can be located within 20 feet of another driveway. We're trying to maintain some um, pedestrian uh, uh, comfort, so we don't want to have a public road that has driveway after driveway after driveway because you create a lot of potential conflicts with pedestrians. So. Um, we want those driveways separated. We strongly encourage the use of shared driveways and there's nothing to prohibit that in this ordinance. In fact, we encourage it. Um, but if you have to have your own separate driveway, it needs to be 20 feet away from the, any existing driveways. 
A flag lot may not abut another flag lot, so it has to abut a regular lot. The flag pole minimum width is 20 feet and the maximum length is 150 feet. And again, it's for that emergency access turnaround. If you get longer than that, we need to have a turnaround. And the flag area, or the flag portion of the property um, has to meet the, that zoning district's minimum lot requirements. And any area of the flag pole, the pole portion, the access portion that reaches the back part, that flag area, that buildable portion of the lot, any of the area located in that pole does not <coughs> contribute to the minimum lot area of the, um, of the flag lot. So it just gets excluded. Moving on to subsection 118 is the streets and the street standards. Um, as I mentioned, the town's requirement today is that streets be designed to meet the NCDOT standard. And that is still our standard with um, a couple small enhancements um, or, or options. Um, first of all, the right-of-way width for all new streets needs to be 45 feet. That's actually our current standard. And steep slope areas are permitted a minimum right-of-way of 32 feet. So they can do a wider right-of-way if they so choose, but if they want a narrower right-of-way, we will permit it in steep slope areas. The reason we do that is because we don't want any other infrastructure wall, retaining walls, you, um, you know, other, th uh, other private stormwater, that sort of thing that needs to be outside of the public right-of-way. And if you have a wider right-of-way, if you require 45 feet, then that often has the effect of pushing additional grading further out. And when you're in a steep slope environment, that results in kind of an exponential increase in the amount of grading disturbance that occurs. So we're going to allow a lesser right-of-way in steep slope areas. We're also going to offer um, a small, um, some leniency for very small extensions of existing roads. So if you're an existing road that dead ends and you only want to extend it, you know, 100 feet or less for an additional lot or two, we will let you do that and you just have to match. You have to, well, it's a minimum of 16 feet of pavement and right of way um, or the existing width, whichever is greater. So it's going to be, and probably in most cases, it's going to be a minimum of 16 feet. Um, and then if you're an extension more than 100 feet, then you just are having to meet the standard, the regular road standards. But we will allow for a taper to be designed by the, the project engineer. Um, there's some additional superfluous language that we're proposing to remove, um, and we're offering some additional uh, clarification related to the dedication. So if you're going to uh, build a street and you want to dedicate it for public maintenance, like we clarify there that you have to go through a separate process and that um, uh, uh, you have to meet the, the town's standards for acceptance before that can be um, approved. So those are the revisions to the subdivision ordinance or the subdivision chapter as chapter 46. I mentioned that we're also looking at chapter 54, which is the zoning code. Um, and what we're proposing here is to add new standards to um, require sidewalks with certain developments. Now this is a new requirement. So this is the, I mentioned earlier that these are primarily uh, clarifications with the one exception. This is that one exception. We are adding a new requirement for sidewalks in certain conditions. So when you add a new requirement, um, you have to uh, identify where it's applicable or when is it applicable. When are sidewalks going to be required? And in this case, we're proposing that sidewalks be required for all projects. So these are our larger projects, major subdivisions over 20 lots, new buildings over 30,000 square feet. Um, or buildings with more than 20 units. So these are projects that the town has already identified as projects that may have an impact on the surrounding area. These, are, these projects at this size trigger a conditional zoning review. And a conditional zoning review allows for additional review that um, is designed to mitigate any potential negative impacts of that development. So this um, this is a, an already established threshold, so it's not arbitrary. So, and in these cases, if these are projects that have impacts that need to be offset, sidewalks are one of those ways to offset the impact of the project. So it seemed an appropriate um, uh, threshold to apply sidewalks. We added additionally um, 
that we would require sidewalks for any project generating over 100 vehicle trips per hour or 1,000 trips per day. This is a different standard, so regardless, you can have a smaller building, less than 30,000 square feet, but if it's a high turnover business, you're going to have a lot of vehicular traffic. If it hits these vehicular traffic uh, marks, then we're going to want to require sidewalk. This is the, the most common scenario is a fast food restaurant or a high turnover restaurant. So once you identify which projects are going to be required sidewalks, you look at the design standards. So first we look at location, where are the sidewalks required. They're going to be required along all row frontages um, located usually in the public right of way. Um, if there's a sub a sufficient right-of-way for a sidewalk to be located, that's where we would want to see it. There will be instances where there isn't sufficient right-of-way, in which case it's possible you can widen a right-of-way, but what's more likely is that the developer would offer an easement um, for the public use of that sidewalk. But it would be on private property, but with a public use easement. The minimum width requirements. So sidewalks are typically five foot. That's your most standard urban sidewalk. Um, but on high speed roads, we want that sidewalk to be located away from the edge of pavement. So on high speed roads over with 35 miles per hour or greater posted speed limit, we want to have an eight foot strip. So you would have your travel lane, your eight foot strip, and your five foot sidewalk. Um, on roads that are less than 35 feet, or excuse me, 35 miles per hour, um, we are looking at a five foot sidewalk with a four foot planting strip. And then in steep slope areas, we're going to um, dispense with the requirement for the planting strip and just allow a six foot back of curb. So that's a little bit wider of a sidewalk, but you don't have the planting strip. So from a, a land real estate standpoint, that's actually a less, um, it's a, a lesser profile. Now, again, in the steep slope areas, if you want to have a wider right-of-way, you want to have um, space between the edge of pavement and the sidewalk, you're certainly allowed to do that. This is just an exception or it gives you a little bit more design flexibility. And then lastly, we have the construction standards. A lot of cities actually have a separate manual of uh, construction details. So when it comes to building a road, they'll actually give you the construction specifications or the sidewalk specifications. We don't have a manual. This would be the first construction detail that the town would uh, put together. We may uh, find a need for a manual in the future, but right now, just to start with this one, um, we're just putting the construction standards right in the ordinance, saying that we have a minimum concrete thickness um, of four inches, a maximum cross slope of 2%, maximum running slope of 5%. These are actually ADA requirements. Um, we're requiring ADA ramps to be installed at curb or street intersections and an easement required when located on private property. Um, the planning board actually discussed sidewalks a couple of months ago at a, at, during one of your regular meetings, but we treated it like a work session. Um, so it was really just an opportunity to kind of talk about ways to regulate and in what, in, you know, some of these standards that I've already gone over. One of the things that was discussed was whether or not we should require fee in lieu. So there could be instances in those examples that I gave earlier when sidewalks are required um, where maybe it doesn't make as much sense to require sidewalk, in which case uh, the developer would have a choice. They could build the sidewalk or they could pay a fee in lieu. And so these were uh, the instances that we had discussed. I think that the planning board had said that they thought made sense and asked us to come back with a fee in lieu option. So um, for buildings that, for those, some of those larger projects, buildings over 30,000 square feet um, or new construction with more than 20 units, when they're located on those low speed roads. This isn't going to be really common. Most of our um, larger development is going to be on the higher speed roads. So we're probably, you know, looking in most cases that this wouldn't, um, this wouldn't apply. <coughs> there could be some instances where it would, in which case we would give those uh, project developers the option of doing a fee in lieu. Um, if a greenway is constructed, if there's a greenway on the property or a greenway is planned and funded, that's probably going to be your off-road transportation uh, option rather than sidewalk, or it could be. So that would be an option. 
And then extensions of existing planned neighborhoods that do not currently have sidewalks. So when I say an extension of existing neighborhood, I'm not talking about a situation where somebody buys 10 acres behind um, an existing neighborhood that had been never developed and never platted, you know, as part of that community and comes in and divides it and says, hey, it's an extension of this existing neighborhood. We're talking about subdivision plats that had been previously approved by the planning board or the board of commissioners um, and is, you know, something that we have a record of. This was a master plan to community and maybe they just haven't gotten to all of their phases and None of the other preceding phases had sidewalks. We're not going to require it in this instance. Um, but in all other cases, it would be required if it's a subdivision with 20 lots or more. And then lastly, maintenance. This is not so much a consideration for the planning board, um, but is probably one that's going to be of greater interest to the town council. So sidewalks is a new piece of public infrastructure that to date has not been required by the town of Woodfin. So if we start requiring sidewalks with, or with development, that means the town is going to have to start maintaining sidewalks. Um, so that does require some consideration on um, a funding standpoint. So now sidewalks are very long lived. New sidewalks can last a very long time. It's gonna be a long time before maintenance needs to be considered. Nevertheless, it needs to be part of the conversation. Um, sidewalks located on private property are going to be maintained privately. The town will not take responsibility for those. Only those sidewalks that are located in the public right-of-way are the ones that the town's going to take over. Um, that includes DOT right-of-way. DOT does not maintain sidewalk. The town would have to maintain any sidewalk that's located in the DOT right-of-way. Uh, we do feel that the proposed changes are consistent with the town's uh, comprehensive plan and other adopted plans. I've uh, identified here um, the reasons that are included in the suggested motion as well as the uh, planning board recommendation. Um, I won't read them. Um, if there is a motion to approve, then uh, the motion maker will read these into the record. Um, but we do find that we do feel that it is consistent and staff is recommending approval of the changes that were proposed. Be happy to answer any questions. Um, and if you all don't have any questions, we can open up the public hearing and see if anybody has any comment. Any questions on the board for Shannon? Asked mine last no. month. I had the, <laughs> we <laughs> asked I had the last opportunity month. to spend the last meeting talking to Shannon about this, so I'm very comfortable with it. You think, Jeff? I'm good. Awesome. There, nobody on the, the public hearing sheet signed up to speak specifically in regards to item number one, but does anybody out there have comments or concerns for Shannon in regards to, I know you, you had a sidewalk deal, but did that answer some questions potentially? Yeah, I guess for, for new development. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a property on 29 Woodfin, and I have a Yeah. Would you, would you like me to address that? Yeah, please. Okay. So the town has for a while recognized that the traffic on Riverside Drive is 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 not great for pedestrians. It's yeah, it's, well. it's not a good environment, um, particularly with the parks going in on the west side. You know, we definitely have interest in trying to create some safe crossings. The challenge with Riverside Drive is that it. Um, yeah, uh, well, Woodfin comes down. Comes the into it. Correct. Um, yep. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so the, um, one of the challenges is that to build sidewalk, you must have an accessible landing. So most sidewalk or a lot of sidewalk in Woodfin and in, in Western North Carolina cannot meet accessibility requirements. Um, if you are going, in particular if you're going to try to do a road crossing, you have to have a place for people to get to. So if, you were, if we were to put a road on Woodfin, we would have to figure out a way to cross people onto river, across Riverside Drive. That's the challenge. We can put sidewalk on Woodfin. That's a possibility. Um, and what this ordinance is suggesting is that any new construction, and it would have to be significant new construction, would trigger those sidewalks. The other option, so it's a little bit of a misconception that cities build sidewalks or build roads we don't developers do um, 
towns and cities maintain sidewalks and roads, but we don't build them. So it's usually the burden is put on the property owner, the developers, to put in that infrastructure. However, there are instances where towns and cities can do sidewalk projects or other infrastructure projects, and they can add sidewalk. That would require funding. Some cases it requires additional easements or right of way, and that can also require funding. Um, it just depends. Um, typically, if a town does this or a city does this, they identify the highest priority areas, things like a park, access to a park, that makes them higher priorities. Um, to date, the town has never entered that kind of exercise. This is something that has come up um, a fair amount in the town's um, early comprehensive planning process. And just a little plug for the town's comprehensive planning process, this is getting reinitiated. This process should start again next month. We have new consultants on board, so there's going to be more opportunity for um, public comment and public input on things like safe sidewalks and, and other kind of transportation connections. So. Shannon, I wanted to ask you, last month um, when Glenda and I were here, you did a really great job of explaining Riverside Drive and some of the high traffic, higher speed roads with regard to sidewalk, not just the topography of Riverside Drive, but also the, the overlap with NCDOT and how it's not just like a flat, we can just get it done. It doesn't work like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's so the NCDOT, we did have a meeting with the NCDOT about Riverside Drive. Um, the NCDOT doesn't typically do sidewalk projects. Um, that would be on the town or the community to, to try to figure out. They will allow us to put sidewalks in, usually, um, but we have to do it to meet these, these standards. And Riverside Drive in particular is really challenging. We don't have sufficient right-of-way. On one side, we have basically a bluff with um, the little bit of space that is there is for stormwater capture to make sure the road is safe and stays dry. The other side, we have a railroad with the railroad right-of-way. So it's, it's a very difficult condition. Um, nevertheless, we, are, um, we have talked with them about the possibility of maybe bringing some sidewalk segments down, and if we can, um, it would take some serious engineering, but we might be able to figure out a way to get at least a couple crossings. And they would probably be like a flasher pedestrian crossing. Yes, sir. Railroad right away, who owns that? <coughs> along Riverside Drive, there's two different railroad rights of way. One is the Norfolk Southern right of way, which is the more active line. And then we have the Craggy Mountain Railway line, which is more of a, an excursion railroad. Um, but they're both active railroad right-of-ways, so... Um, Do they have to be maintained with certain standards? I don't... I safe? don't know the answer to that. I'm, yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. It's like if you want to keep your railway there, yeah. keep it up, maintain it, or get it out. <laughs> they're, they're both operational. I know, I know that much, so yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Did that get at what you were? Yeah, asking? that was uh, yeah, that was great. Thanks. Anybody else? I guess yeah. I mean, so the comprehensive planning, I'm sure, will look at the way to kind of integrate the greenway system with any potential sidewalks. I mean, that's going to of course be part of it, right? The comprehensive planning process is is really a vision visioning process. So it's it's an opportunity for the town um, to to say, you know, these are our these are our aspirations, these are our priorities, and we should be working and making steps to try to achieve these goals. So something like safe transportation connections, alternative transportation connections, these are things that you often hear come out of the planning process. Um, so assuming that is something that comes out of our planning process, then the next step would be to look at things like code requirements. Um, you know, should we try to apply for grants from, you know, the state in order to do transportation projects, things of that nature. So the Greenway um, that's part of the WGB along Riverside Drive, that is a transportation project. We got federal money through the state in order to, to construct that. So you can do that sometimes with sidewalks too. So. Yes, sir. Everyone was a bond created many years ago for the Greenway. 
nothing has occurred. I approached Town Hall eight years ago regarding the walking traffic along Merriman. We were the highway, it was dangerous for walking. Um, I bought the Town Hall at the time. <clears throat> and um, it just seems to me that I'm not quite sure where our property taxes are going since there are no <laughs> infrastructure is, is minimal. So I'm happy to say that the entirety of the WGB project, which is two parks and five and a half miles of Greenway, is funded. Um, it's a $30 million project. $4 million of that came from the bond. So that $4 million allowed us to leverage the additional 26. So that's, that's a pretty good return on, on that investment. So we're, we're pretty excited. One park is done. The other park um, will begin construction next year. And the Greenway, because most of that funding is coming through the state, we have to wait until that money is available, which is probably going to be 24, 25, somewhere in that range. So it's going to be a little while for the Greenway. But the money is guaranteed. Um, it's just not available yet. So we got a little off topic, but these are all good questions. So. Unless there's anything else we're going to talk about for sidewalk subdivisions, um, then if anybody wants to make the motion to vote on this particular amendment item, we can. And there is a motion in your staff report. There should be um, that includes the consistency findings. <laughs> Probably should officially open it a minute ago. Okay, so at 637, we'll close it. Thank you. Perfect. No, Glenda, right are you ready? I thought this one is not the right one. It's almost right there. Oh, <laughs> okay. I move that the Town of Woodfin Planning Board finds the proposed text amendment is reasonable, is in the public interest, is consistent with the Town of Woodfin Comprehensive Plan, and meets the development needs of the community in that request provides additional clarity and predictability to development requirements, thereby supporting economic development, enhances standards for orderly growth and development, resulting in compatible infill development, including a more urban form along strategic corridors, and advances public health, safety, and welfare by increasing multi multimodal transportation options where it is needed most in the town. Second. <laughs> No, Did somebody second it? Yes. Am I going to second it? You're going to second it? <laughs> I can't. I'll second it. <laughs> All right. All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Let it be. Cool. So now we're going to move on to uh, the second hearing. And this one will be the short term rentals. Shannon's going to go first. So you're going to hear what the town of Woodfin is proposing. Once the public hearing for that starts, then we're going to go back to this list. You'll come up, give a, a nice little three minutes or, or so talk, and, and let the next person go about their three minutes. And if you could please state your name yeah. for the record. So we'll have it for the um, record. Yep. Thank you. Cool. All right. So as Jay has indicated, the next item on the agenda is another public hearing for another set of text amendments, this time to Chapter 30, the Short-Term Rental Ordinance, and Chapter 54, the Zoning Ordinance. And this is for the purpose of updating standards for short-term rentals and homestays. So to begin, Chapter 30, Short-Term Rentals. So this is the easy part of the proposed changes. We're proposing to delete the entire chapter, Chapter 30. And the reason we're doing that is because short-term renting is a land use. It's a land use activity, and that falls squarely under zoning. So short-term rentals shouldn't stand alone as a separate ordinance. These requirements should be folded into the zoning code. So that is what we are proposing to do. So the first step's easy, delete chapter 30, but we're going to take some of those requirements and we're going to fold them into chapter 54. So chapter 54, um, we are proposing five basic changes. The first is to consolidate and update the permitted uses table, which currently is located as an appendix, appendix A to the code. And we want to move that into the body of the code in article five. Um, 
In the individual zoning districts, we have little individual mini use tables. So there's the consolidated table in chapter or in appendix A, but then within each district is a sub table. Those sub tables are not necessary and it's just confusing and it introduces opportunity for conflict. So we want to take out those separate tables and just have the one you know, consistent and consolidated and comprehensive use table. Um, we need to update the definitions for homestay, short-term rental, and hotel motel inns, um, primarily so we can clarify what those uses are and make distinctions between the uses so it's very clear when you're one type of lodging use versus another type of lodging use. And then number three, we want to create a new use category called limited uses. It doesn't have to be called limited uses, that's just the name I picked. If somebody has a better name that they want to offer, I'm all ears. Um, but we have three different types of uses typically in a, in a permitted use table or in a use table. You have your, your permitted uses, which these are uses that are allowed without any special requirements other than your basic development requirements. Um, then you have your limited uses, which these are also uses that are allowed by right in that district. They don't require special approval, but they do require that you meet certain requirements that don't, maybe not, may not apply to other uses. And then the third use is a conditional use. Um, that's a different category. That does require special approval. That would have to go before the town council. And as the name would suggest, it, it opens you up to, or those projects up to having special, unique conditions applied, um, typically to offset any impacts from the project. So those are the three types. Currently, our code only has conditional, and permitted uses, it doesn't have that, that um, in-between category, that limited uses category. So we want to add that. And we want to make homestays and short-term rentals um, limited uses. So they would be allowed in the districts that we designate, but with special requirements. Um, and then we want to enhance enforcement, or we have some suggestions for enhancing enforcement. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that when we get to it. So a little bit more detail about those five changes. So here's just a little snip from our use table so you can kind of see what it looks like. You have your list of uses on the left-hand side, your zoning districts across the top, and you'll have a little X is, um, indicates that that's a use that's permitted in that zoning district. If you'll see that there are some S's on there, today those stand for special uses. I, sorry, I was calling conditional, I was referring to it as conditional uses earlier. That's what we used to call them before 160D. The state's uh, land use chapter was updated and they said, no, we're going to, from here on, going to call them special uses. So that's what that S is for. It's for special uses. And that's what I was referring to when I referred to conditional uses. Um, so we would add a new category in L. So in certain districts, like under, um, you know, those residential districts, if you scrolled down, y you would find homestay and in those columns, you'd have a little L, you know, and it, it would just mean that it's permitted in that residential district, but you have some requirements that you have to satisfy when you get your permit. So the definitions. Um, I put some draft definitions in here. Um, I'm not going to read them. Um, the main thing I want to point out is that with dwelling, the definition for dwelling, this is a change that should have happened with 160D, and I just noticed that it didn't get done. Um, because homestays and short-term rentals are lodging activities that occur inside dwellings, we want to make sure we have a sound definition for dwelling. And the state told us how to define dwelling, so that isn't really up for debate. Um, homestay, we're just clarifying that this is a lodging use that occurs within a private resident-occupied dwelling um, with guest rooms provided to transients for periods of less than 30 days. That's what transient means it means that it's somebody staying there not on a permanent basis which is defined as less than 30 days um, and we also want to clarify that the lodging activity is subordinate to the main residential use of that home so it is first and foremost a residence for somebody um, and uh, but it also has this lodging activity occurring also on a interim basis Short-term rental is a little bit different. It's, it is also a lodging use that incurs in a private dwelling, um, but you don't have um, 
it's not resident occupied, meaning you don't have anybody living there on a permanent full-time basis. Um, and I am proposing, uh, this is a, kind of buried in there, but in the definition of short-term rental, I'm proposing that a short-term rental has a maximum of three bedrooms. The reason I'm doing this is because we heard quite a bit in the town hall meeting uh, earlier this summer that they're, particularly with these larger homes, these six bedroom homes, seven bedroom homes, um, that this, in these residential districts, that these are the nuisance issues, or these are the properties that most commonly have nuisance issues. When you have such large parties, um, short-term renting in, a, in the middle of a neighborhood, you're gonna have more issues with off-street parking, with noise, um, people coming and going, with um, things just getting out of control. Um, hotels, motels, and inns are defined as a commercial lodging establishment containing more, than, containing more than three guest bedrooms. So when you get into that category, you are now, you know, if you're that six bedroom house, you're now in this new lodging category, hotels, motels, and inns. Um, but of course, the more commercial or historically um, common hotel would, you know, probably the second half of the definition is probably what we think of you know, containing ancillary facilities, laundry, dining areas, exercise rooms. That's your typical, um, you know, Holiday Inn or Hilton. Or so the way that reads is if it has four bedrooms, then it would either, it would be classified as a hotel, motel, or inn. Yeah, basically an inn an is inn, what yeah. we're saying. Is, you know, maybe it's probably not a hotel, it's more like an inn. It's getting in that bed and breakfast inn category. Um, the third change was to create a new, that new use category, the limited uses for homestays and short-term rentals. We would reorganize section 54-144, and um, these are the different sections of that subsection, and we would insert that entire table into this section with these additional clarifications. Um, then we would add standards for homestays and short-term rentals. For homestays, we're recommending that we require off-street parking. Um, that hasn't been determined yet if it should be half a space or one space per bedroom. It's, it's very common to say one per bedroom. So if you're renting um, two bedrooms, then you would need two off-street parking spaces. Uh, we require, we would re recommend requiring proof of insurance. Your standard homeowner's insurance does not cover short-term rentals, so you would need an umbrella policy or, or something else. Um, we would want a mandatory contact, um, and that would have to be part of the application. And when I say contact, I mean an individual who is responsible for the goings-on of that rental. So if there is an issue, we have a name and a number of somebody to contact. That would also have to be posted inside the unit in the event that there is an issue. The, the guests would also have access to that contact information. They probably already do, but we want it posted inside the unit. Um, and we would recommend prohibiting special events. We also heard that in the town hall meeting that um, things like weddings or other um, you know, music events, things like that, were creating issues in some of our neighborhoods. For short-term rentals, um, we would limit where they would go. So right now, short-term rentals are permitted in the R7 and R10 category. They're not permitted in any of the other residential districts. Um, so we're proposing to pull back on the R7 and the R10 category and only allow them in those residential districts where we currently allow lodging, hotels, motels, inns. So that is the commercial shopping and light industrial districts. We would require off-street parking, again. Um, we would recommend limiting the number of permits, and I'm sorry, I skipped over that on the homestead side, homestay side as well. What we're saying is that if you want a short-term rental, we heard again in the town hall meeting, we heard a lot of folks say, you know, but for this short-term rental or this homestay, you know, I wouldn't have the same level of security. I wouldn't be able to put my kids through college. I wouldn't be able to put new tires on my truck, you know, things like that. And those are all very, um, that is a very valuable um, uh, stream of revenue that we would like our homeowners to be able to tap into in order to preserve their housing security or enhance their housing security. But we don't want to open it up for investors, right? We want to secure, you know, give our residents some security, but we're not necessarily looking to commercialize our neighborhoods. 
So we would recommend limiting the number of permits for both homestays and short-term rentals to, to one per owner. And we would define owners including anybody who has a 20% uh, 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 or more uh, ownership interest in an LLC. So if you're an LLC and you've got three members of that LLC, they're all owners with a 20% interest or more than a 20% interest, so therefore they're all limited to that one permit. I hope that makes sense. Um, same proof of insurance, same requirement for a contact, again, prohibiting special events, and the limit on the number of units in the multifamily building or development community. Um, a common limit is 25%, um, but that's um, up for discussion. Um, and then lastly, the, the fifth potential change is we could look, we could explore enhanced enforcement. This is an option. I will be the first to tell you I have had a fair amount of experience with short-term rental enforcement. Um, this is a very difficult set of standards to enforce. Um, it, is, I, it is not the recommended way to try to manage short-term rentals through enforcement. It is much preferable to manage uh, the use through permitting and not through enforcement. But when you do have those nuisance cases, it's helpful. So um, we could consider escalating fines. Our current zoning fine is $50 a day. If we find that somebody is operating illegally or they're violating the conditions of their permit, we could issue a notice of violation that could result in a citation. And if we get to that point, and we usually almost always resolve it before we get to fines, but if we get to that point, it's $50 a day for that first offense. If it happens again, we would escalate it to $300 a day, and if it happens a third time, $500 a day, and you revoke the permit. So that's, that's an option. I'll be honest. I don't know that we'll ever get to revoking a permit. I don't know that we'll ever get past $300 a day. You almost always resolve the enforcement matter before you even get to that first fine. So this, isn't, this is just in the worst case scenario. I have a quick question. Um, is the revocation on the address or the human with the permit or both? It would be the, well, your permit runs with the land, so it would be the, um, the, the address. So the reason I'm asking because this is, there's something else in my world that where this there's a conflict, so I'm asking how this shakes out in this situation. When it runs with the land, then oftentimes if owners change, there's still a revocation. Well, that would be an entirely new permit. Um, if you change owners, the new owner, I'll have to think about that, actually. Okay. Yeah. yeah. But I, that, that is an excellent point. I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll try to look into that. Um, so I would also, we heard in the town hall meeting a lot of suggestions for other things that we could consider, that we could regulate. Um, we cannot do annual permits. This was um, clarified loud and clear by a case recently, the um, Schrader versus the city of Wilmington. People have probably heard about the Wilmington case. Um, that was uh, largely misunderstood. A lot of people thought that it meant towns couldn't even require a permit. And so I just want to make it really clear, we can definitely require a permit, and we do require permits for short-term rentals. If anybody here, anybody listening has a short-term rental and they do not have a permit, you yeah, need to come yeah. in right away and get a permit, because <laughs> it is required. Um, we just can't do what's called a registration or an annual permit. We can't make them register their short-term rental and make them re-register it every year. That's what we can't do. Um, there are some requirements that are kind of tied to that annual registration. You could uh, technically consider a separation requirement or a density requirement of some kind, but it's kind of tied to that annual permit, or it was in the Wilmington case. Probably better to steer clear of that. It's also a very challenging standard to apply. It would also be similarly difficult to put a cap on the total number of rentals. It's very difficult to do that in a fair and equitable way. Um, a cap on the number of times a property could be rented. It's not a very practical, there's no practical way to keep up with the number of times that people are renting their properties. 
and it's also not practical and there's no real way to be able to keep up with the number of guests that are staying that has also been suggested um, also requiring a minimum stay um, saying that they have to stay for two weeks three days there's no real way for us to track that um, it said in the paper today uh, I think Buckham County said the city of Asheville has a 30-day requirement I figured you'd know <laughs> that yeah. I thought is not for homestays or short-term rentals um, any unit that you know if you say in Asheville you can't have any short-term rentals in residential districts period period okay so what some homeowners do is they um, they don't live on the property they don't have a, it's not a homestay but they'll rent it for a minimum of 30 days that meets Asheville's definition it meets our definition too of a long-term rental so that's one way that some folks even though they're just staying a short time they say it's they might only say a short time but they they technically lease it for a whole month so you still have that short-term renter um, but you control the amount of times the property gets occupied um, then lastly uh, there has been the there was a training recently that went through short-term rental regulation that was offered by the School of Government and it was thrown out that uh, you can towns can towns and cities can explore amortization and as I've listed here amortization is a technique for the removal of non-conforming uses um, after uh, the value of the non-conforming use has been recovered or amortized over a period of time um, so what this is saying is that in if you if we were as an example if we were to support the idea of removing short-term rentals in R7 and R10 uh, folks who have them now are um, commonly hear the term grandfathered they're they're vested they continue they have their permit they're lawfully non-conforming they got the proper permit they established the use when it was lawful they can continue that use what amortization does is says yes you are lawful but over time we're going to expect you to come into compliance so we're going to give you a period of time um, the school of government suggested a minimum of 12 to 18 months uh, if this was something that we wanted to explore I would feel comfortable with a longer time period I would say three to five years um, and it's an opportunity for somebody who maybe invested extra to upfit an accessory unit or make some improvements expecting a certain return on that investment through the short-term renting it gives them an opportunity to, to recoup that investment so that's what amortization is supposed to do that's how it's supposed to work another question I know if it isn't in R7 or R10 then it's already illegal and shouldn't exist right correct and this wouldn't apply you can't get a permit if you're illegal you're not vested okay because so we have a lot of, of uh, short-term rentals in other categories so um, this isn't necessarily included in my recommendation this is just something I wanted to share as an option um, if it's something that the planning board was interested we can look into it further and um, bring back I, I, some standards I have one question that wasn't in the presentation but you had mentioned in the in the description that Mountain Village would be allowing it is that still that this was in a hand something you sent us it, it wasn't up here is this it, in out the, of date is it in the staff report or what is it um, work session text amendment Shannon for this meeting it's t it's dated for this meeting um, I that might have been a mistake if I okay, did that okay. um, I we would well it's good I'm glad you I, said I it's mean a it, it can it can go either way like we can put it in that category um, the town's position is that short-term rentals uh, well it's being explored whether or not short-term rentals are lawful in Mountain Village today so we would want to clarify it one way or the other we would want to clarify that they're clearly allowed or they're clearly not allowed right um, and isn't that where most of the proposed development is right now that is trying to set up short-term rentals in those uh, areas one of the two Mountain Village developments that is pending does is is uh, uh, proposing short-term rentals or that the property owners would have the choice of doing short-term rentals so could go either way um, 
What? Another question. What if you have an HOA in the, those condos that have been built on Reynolds Mountain, where they're control the developers controlling the HOA and not and and turning most of them into Airbnbs, except for the poor people who bought. Um, yeah. how so that property is actually zoned commercial shopping. So it's it commercially okay. zoned property. They've um, moved. Yeah, so they're they're allowed to do short-term renting. It is one of the districts that allows lodging. Um, it's just it's just unusual that it was zoned commercial shopping. I think the intent was to have the village, you know, extended. Right. Um, and when that didn't happen, you know, okay. this other development makes in. sense. Mm -hmm. um, we do feel that the changes that we're proposing tonight are consistent with the town's comprehensive plan. Um, again, here I've listed in the ways in which it is consistent. Um, this is not, as I mentioned earlier, we were not necessarily intending for this to move on. Oftentimes you all make a recommendation, you vote, and it moves on to town council, and they're the final deciding body. We're treating this a little bit more as an input session, work session. Um, so it's an opportunity to talk about these standards, how they may or may not be applied, what works well, what doesn't work well. So. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions from the board. Um, otherwise, I think we can open the public hearing. Yeah. Anybody else got questions for Shannon? I've been asking them, yeah. so. <laughs> I have a lot, but I think I want to hear from the public. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, and I might suggest that I imagine people may ask questions, and I'll try to make note of those questions, and maybe at the end I can come back up and try to answer some. Perfect. So, thank you. Mm -hmm. Sound good? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, with that, we will open the public uh, comment portion of, of this hearing and I'm just going to start going right down the list um, that's going to put Matt if you want to come up and speak and remember guys you got roughly three minutes uh, might might give you a few extra seconds there on the on the back end but try not to go crazy yeah I don't I don't think I'll take and remember time. to state your name please yeah. Matt Allen uh, I work for the local Realtor Association we have 2200 members across Madison Buncombe and Transylvania counties and uh, you know we've been very much involved in the short-term rental discussion for a while now in fact last fall we commissioned a study on the economic impact and the housing impact of short-term rentals in Buncombe County um, so we'd be you know very much interested in sharing that with you all uh, as a part of this discussion also you know I just want to make it clear the realtors are certainly not for the Wild West we absolutely are are into common sense regulation and we have several really good examples of ordinances some of the stuff that's being proposed is certainly stuff that we are are supportive of like proof of insurance different things like that um, I guess my comment would be we just want to be involved and 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 want this to be intentional uh, the city of Brevard for example they created a short-term rental task force late last year they're really, really being methodical about what they're going to do as far as regulations go. And um, you know, they involved us. We actually got a similar study for Transylvania and Brevard with the economic, economic impact and the housing impact. And I believe that task force is going to make their recommendations um, in a month or two. Um, something else I'll say, the amortization component is just very disconcerting as, as um, the young lady mentioned Sydney you know that that's just problematic for a number of reasons from just the reasonable expectations of a purchaser and a property owner and getting that return on investment so you know again I, I know um, uh, Ms. Tuck just mentioned you know ex extending that as, as far as possible to ensure return on investment but I, I just would submit that uh, I hope we can be very careful with that aspect of it um, the other thing I'll just mention finally is the county is considering perhaps taxing STRs as a commercial use. I think it would be prudent to see how that plays out before you know, the, the, the town makes any final decisions on how they're going to regulate uh, short-term rentals and do these changes. Um, so uh, to, just to sum up, the realtors are here. We'd love to be a part of any discussions regarding changes to the ordinance here in Woodfin. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Michelle. Uh, 
Hello, I'm Michelle Wires. I've lived here for about 10 years in Woodfin. Um, a few years ago, my mother and I invested in a short-term rental here in Woodfin, and that was primarily to supplement um, me having enough income to remain in Woodfin. So um, that's what we've been doing for the last few years. I'm also an Airbnb ambassador, which means that I coach um, hosts of short-term rentals in the area into good hosting practices, which include many of the things that you were discussing prior, you know, proof of insurance, um, great contact with neighbors in case there is an issue, there's communication there, that sort of thing. Um, so I am a supporter of many of the things that you were mentioning, but I also think that um, some of these things, such as the, the amortization, um, would have a really large impact on your residents, especially economically. Um, you know, many people come to these short-term rentals and create lasting memories in Woodfin, and I think it does build a sense of community. So I think when you're, um, you know, causing harm to the short-term rentals in the area, um, you can have an impact on that, and especially your residents economically. So I just want to urge you to hopefully consult with Matt and his short-term rental alliance that he's put together. Um, they put a ton of time and effort into, um, you know, doing these studies and gathering, um, you know, what the economic impact would be on these areas. So I'm um, just urging the town to consult with them and take further measures to just hear out the community and, um, you know, take some extra time to discuss this. So I appreciate that. Awesome. Thank you, Audrey. I'm sorry, Michelle. Audrey, you're next. I had you on my list next. Audrey. Andre. Andre. Hey, guys. <laughs> a lot of realtors in the house. Are you one? No, my wife is. Okay. <laughs> so I'm actually, I was say fugitive. No, I'm actually migrated here 10 years. Oh, my sorry. name is Andre, and I'm just all. I migrated here 20 years ago. I came to the land of opportunity, which is America, you know, to live the dream. And that's what we're doing. Working very hard. My wife is a realtor. We all own a few properties in Buncombe County. And we just bought a house on Woodfin. So my wife is like, you should check out that meeting. See how that goes. So I might not be that prepared, but I want to say that in the four years that we've been running short-term rentals, and we do have other businesses aside. Like I said, my wife is a realtor. I own a trucking company. So we do that on the side. But in the three years that we've been doing it, uh, we never had a problem with the neighbors. And that's mainly because, like the lady was saying, she wants to limit it to three bedrooms. Maybe because all of our houses were three bedrooms and some were two bedrooms and we never had 15 people or 20 people there. And when they did want to have a party or host a party, we just simply told them that's not possible. We just not accept the reservation. Even if you paid a lot more, we would just decline the reservation. And we never had problems with the neighbors. So um, we do want to keep investing our time and effort to maybe acquire more properties. And uh, I know a lot of people are thinking and are saying that a lot of investors in, uh, here are coming and buying and Skyrox, the, you know, the, the, the home prices, but we know Asheville is a hot market, so the prices have been going up in Asheville very quickly, like better than other spots of North Carolina. And um, yeah, I think uh, the residents of North Carolina, like me and my wife, we should have the right to keep doing this because we live here, we're a part of Western North Carolina, we build, we create jobs. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited. I, I think you guys will make the right decisions. Matt looks like he's been done a lot of research, so I hope you guys, <laughs> everybody's talking good things about Matt, so he looks like a very strong guy. <laughs> so yeah, I'm looking forward to see how this goes. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Andre. Brian. I'll wait. You gonna wait? Okay. Eleanor? I am Eleanor Floyd. I live on Audubon Drive in an R21 district, zoning district, that has a short-term rental. I know this meeting is not about that, but I would like to talk with you about it. Um, but my suggestion to you guys is make some very firm rules. Now, you're saying three bedrooms, that's good. I think we have six next door to us. And it does create a problem, but I have worked with the owners. And there are things like um, four vehicles at a time. We had anywhere from 10 to 33 vehicles that we had to deal with. 
but they have limited it to four. Sometimes there'll be a fifth and I don't say anything. But I was um, out working in the yard not too long ago and there were 11 vehicles in the cul-de-sac. So I called the owners. So make, make some regulations like you have a contact. Have the contact and what I have done, I've contacted the person and said, okay, 30 minutes, and I call the police. So put something stiff in there. And also about um, the parking, we're on a cul-de-sac, which makes people think they have freedom to park anywhere. I will go to the people and say, look, park over there. I've had them park in front of my mailbox when there'd be three cars over there. There's no excuse for that kind of thing. And that's when you call the police and say, you know, do something. Um, I have put notes on cars to please move the car. Or I've called the people and said, have it moved because I want to get out. Uh, have a maximum occupancy. I don't know right now what theirs is. It may be 11 people. But they did say no parties, no extra events. Um, they have a deck. They, have, they did have a fire pit outside. But now they have something on the deck. But they say, you know, that ends at 9.30. And it may seem ridiculous to set rules, but if you don't, you don't have a chance. And also, um, as far as noise levels, if you can hear them inside your house, to me, that's too much noise. They need to stop. That's your time. Okay. And I'll have a minimum age for rental. That's about it. We, we had to get no motorcycles because we had one group that was fine. Next group came in. Now, I know I'm over time, but it's important. So I knew we were going out of town, so I went to the people and I said, look, this is a quiet neighborhood. Please, you know, keep the noise down. The guy looks at me and says, this is a Harley. It will be loud. I got a call. I was out of town. I got a call at 11.30 at night saying there were 23 vehicles and a bonfire three feet high on the no. And I called the owners and I said, look, I'll give you 30 minutes to clear this out. And they did. But the person that called me, I wouldn't give them the phone number because they were too angry. But Things like that, that's where we need to be. Thank you, Ms. Allen. Thank you. Nancy. Nancy Wallace. Nancy Wallace, I also am at Audubon Drive, and I am so appreciative of this committee, I could just scream. Thank you for addressing the issues of short-term rentals, because we had a heck of a time getting them looked at before, so good job. I also have concerns about um, steep slope and parking. If you're going to allow short-term rentals, um, parking is bad on steep slopes regardless. If it's a, a resident, what do you do if you have company? Where do they go? And even if it's not a short-term rental, we're on village steep slope, mountain village stuff. Are people supposed to park? If it, that's a concern. Um, and Although we are very concerned about people who have invested and purchased property so that they can have a short-term rental, whatever block that is, there are four, ten other houses where people were looking to live in a nice residential area and have a peaceful environment and not have a lot of coming and going. So although we're looking at the human aspects of short-term rentals. We also have to look at all the other people living on the street. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you, Nancy. John Anderson? I'll pass. Pass? Okay. That leaves you, Mike. I'm a real estate agent as well, and we don't get retirement. Monsar doesn't provide us with any retirement. Will you, state, will you state your name? Yeah, Michael Dr. Maloney. I have a property on 29 Woodfin. Um, that's my retirement. That's part of my retirement because I, I've been self-employed all my life. There's many people in this community that are seniors that rely on that income. I can understand about not having investors come and buy blocks and blocks and, and you know, and create a big commercial district, and that's what I don't want to see happen. Amen, brother. I, I don't want to see that happen. It's already happening in Asheville by large corporations that are buying large blocks of property <coughs> and renting them out. It's long-term rental, which is not let it, letting other people buy these homes that want to live in the community. But <coughs> the vacation rental is a unique thing because it allows people that right now the average night, one night stay in Asheville is $252 and up. It, Woodfin has the opportunity with uh, the short term rentals to be able to provide for families that need a kitchen and stuff, not to party, not events. We don't allow that. We have strict restrictions and Matt's following that with, uh, with LOTSAR is providing restrictions so we never see a problem with the community or people in the community. We, we value the people in the community who don't want to see that happen. I don't want to see that happen at all. So um, we provide, I'm providing jobs for local cleaners in Woodfin and handyman and gardeners and lawn service and painting that would not otherwise have this income. So it's really helping people that are in need of income in this community. Um, and it's, I, I just see the good stuff about Woodfin with that park built down there and stuff like this. I think this this town could be another charming town and, and build into something really special because it's close to Asheville, but it's not in Asheville, which is a big advantage. So the amortization thing, I really, I hope to pray that doesn't happen because that's going to ruin my retirement. It's going to uh, ruin a lot of people's retirement that depend on, on, on rental properties. Um, and also I have one question to you too. I filled out a permit for my property in March 2000. 21 with COVID and came up with a mask and headed to, to a mask, this permit. And I don't never got confirmation that it was received. So I don't know who to talk to about that. And has the permit changed since I registered in March 2021 for short term rental? I think Shannon's writing your name down so she can help you afterwards in, in regards to your permitting process. And I think permit's a great idea. I think, it's a, I think it has to be done as far as having some standards so that way we do well in the community and we don't hurt the community. So that's about for now. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. All right, Brian, last shot. Okay. Awesome. So that's, that's everybody that I have on, on my list. Uh, if I missed you, yeah. come on. And just for the record, again, this is Eric. The, um, <laughs> yeah. Come up front, I'm Eric. Eric Thank you. Um, like Mike, um, I actually manage Mike's property. Um, I lost my job some, some years ago. I was laid off, and um, I took my retirement money, and I bought a vacation rental. Um, and I showed a few of my friends who are local how, how to do it. And um, that's also my retirement. <laughs> I'm also a realtor. and. Um, I don't have a retirement plan, so when I was laid off, I went into real estate and I taught uh, a couple of locals how to do it, and, and you know, and set them up. And um, you know, we're also part of the community. Um, you know, like just just like Mike, and I'm sure some other people in here that this was an investment that we made for for our future and for our family. I've lived in Nashville for 20 years. Uh, my wife is from here. Um, I've assisted a couple of people within the Woodton area um, who do have some larger units. Um, but we don't allow partying. Um, that was a big investment for those people who purchased those properties that are a little bit larger. And for me, I, I have a family of, um, of eight brothers. And typically, when we go and spend time together, um, our houses aren't big enough to house all of us. So we go and we get a place together. Um, we're not having a loud party. We're, you know, we're just spending time. It's my mom, my dad, 
my three or four brothers, we get together and we kind of just hang out together. Um, and that's typically how our larger units are being used. We don't have a lot of them because they're expensive, but we do have a handful of them that we manage and uh, typically they're used for, for small groups to get together. Uh, we don't allow powering, partying. We, uh, we, we've had zero noise complaints. We've had zero complaints about anything, especially in the, the Woodfin area. So um, also the amortization process would, would be devastating to uh, myself and, and most of my clients. So um, that's just something I would be super concerned about uh, for the people who did, you know, put their investments and their, their retirement into something like this. So. I didn't really have anything prepared. I've heard about this last minute, but um, those are my concerns. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Any, yeah, okay, we got two. We'll go right here first. Yes, ma'am. I'm just going to go front, front rows to the back rows. My name is Christy Johnson, and I'm actually here representing my parents who um, purchased a small cottage in Woodfin um, to both use for themselves. My dad has Alzheimer's and they come up a week a month because they want to be near their grandparents or, or their grandkids, which are my kids. Um, but the other part of the time they rent it out and that helps them be able to make it work. So you, you know, there are countless stories like this, right? Um, so I think that what I would urge you to consider at, at, and what I heard um, Shannon saying too is just more discussion because there's going to be an economic impact. You've already heard that. Um, many of the people who have stayed in ours actually were looking to buy a home in this area, or they loved it so much that now they're looking um, and they come back. So I think um, I would urge you to consider Matt's suggestion of starting a task force, really engage the community, and think about how we can do this in the way that Eleanor has done it with her, her owner, where the neighbors are really working together so that we have all different kind of people living in the neighborhood and we're all working as community members. We're talking to each other. So if something happens, like there's 33 cars, that's absurd. We talk about it. Um, but that's going to take a, a, you know, some more discussion because a lot of these things just don't make sense right now. Um, it doesn't seem like. So thank you. Thanks for your work. I know it's, a, it's challenging. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thanks very much for the opportunity. My name is Jessica Bernstein. Uh, I appreciate you all taking this on. This is a big endeavor. I wanted to talk about a couple of things that I thought sounded really good. The first one was the part of the proposal to limit the number of short-term rentals that are in multifamily buildings. I think that's great. Um, if the number of, um, of units in the building is not limited, then that essentially allows for a large multifamily building to be a de facto hotel or resort building. And that is absolutely something that, that we don't want to have. I attended the town hall meeting earlier in the summer and a lot of the uh, negative points that came up were primarily about folks who bought into a, a multi-unit building expecting it to be, you know, a number of, of, of people who reside here all the time and, and it was essentially just a, a turnkey uh, resort. And so that I think is a really essential part of the proposal. I liked the idea about um, additional limitations for steep slope areas because those areas do have challenges with access and with parking. Uh, I'm, I'm really concerned about the comments about short-term rentals in Mountain Village zoning. Uh, I know that that Mountain Village zoning currently is not designated for short-term rentals in <coughs> Chapter 30 and in the Table of Uses. The most similar um, lodging uses, hotels, motels, and inns are not, not, proposed, or not permitted in Mountain Village. So I think that that's really important for, to follow that line of consideration that short-term rentals would not be allowed in Mountain Village currently or, or uh, in the future. Um, if for some reason that is not the, the determination of the town, if the town determines that Mountain Village does allow for short-term rentals, then I think that amortization is, is essential for those zoning districts. As you saw at the, your meeting on August 2nd, when there were Mountain Village properties that were rezoned, uh, two of those properties were not able to re be rezoned, and they are surrounded by lower density single family zoning on all sides. So we're, we're really concerned about that ability for multifamily buildings to be 
built as de facto resorts. So thanks for your consideration. There's a lot of, a lot of heartfelt opinions on all the sides of this, and we, um, the town appreciates you all allowing everyone to speak on it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Jessica. Anybody else? Come on up, Gus. Uh, Gus Mojica, again, uh, going off from the comments onto the things. One, uh, just considering timelines for these things, um, I would highly, you know, consider greater research. Uh, sounds to me like it is necessary. Um, I, I have no idea, and this may be out there, like how many permit, how many current permitted uses are there right now in the zonings that are already R7 and R10. Um, I mean, R21 is already non-compliant, so that would be a simple one because of density. Um, why was 7 and, and 10 chosen historically as okay places to do this? Um, that'd be an interesting uh, place of research to find out why that was not a problem at some point. Um, and also realizing that the revitalization of Woodfin, sure, gentrification comes this way, but as an agent, one of a million, uh, in this town. Only, only in this room. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, Including so, two you know, up here. It's just hard to disconnect and have that vested interest. But also, uh, we, our clients have invested in those R7 and 10s, not as pilot programs for the town. They invested them as real estate that they could use for that purpose. And so had they known this was a pilot program, they might have thought different about their investments. And uh, a lot of these homes are nicer, bringing the values quite up, you know, um, removing some of the older homes who the folks who were living in there have benefited immensely from the the impact that they were able to make by selling in those zones um, and so those economically I'm not an economist by any means I'm just a lowly realtor but um, you know to take into consideration uh, a, a lot of the numbers more facts you know the impacts I'd like to see what does reducing the numbers actually help in regards to affordable housing for example you know, where, how, if we want that impact, then let's see that that impact is directly correlated to this uh, short-term rental uh, situation, if it is a situation at all. So these are just things that obviously, you know, you guys um, don't envy your position in having to deal with this because there are a lot of, uh, you know, people who have invested in this. But considering a further and a deeper study in order to get the clear, clear measures as to why that is, um, you know, again, it's kind of a before this stuff becomes set into stone would probably much be, be a worthy stuff, especially the new change in, in leadership so that everyone has the opportunity to kind of feel what the town is doing um, as leadership changes as well. So take your time. And uh, okay. thanks. Thanks for your time. Thanks, Thank guys. you. Hey, my name is Brian Furry. Um, I don't think I have anything wholly unique to say. Uh, we've heard a lot of people kind of echoing some similar thoughts. I want to say I'm a contractor. We also don't have retirement. Um, I recently turned a home that I lived in into a short-term rental. It does have four bedrooms. I am terrified of the word amortization now. Thank you very much. <laughs> and it has allowed me to be able to increase the quality of my life, spend more time with my children, I'm not by any means retired, but it is helping tremendously the income that I get from running a short-term rental in Woodfin. So strongly urge you to think hard and long about amortization of legally obtained permits for that use. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Anyone else? Come on up. Uh, I'm Travis Minch. I also have a short-term rental, um, and it is it brings in a lot of income, um, and I would totally be all for if even if there was a way to put a tax on the amount of income that I bring in, um, that would, could somehow be reused to put back into the community of Woodfin. Um, is something I don't know how hard that is to enforce or create, but. If we said we're going to start taxing the people who already have them and put it towards the schools or to help people who can't afford housing in the town of Woodfin, that's something I think would go a long way to help the community as well. Um, for the people who are already have rentals and are bringing in that income, 
but you know they make a little bit less I think they could all handle that versus having that extra financing put back into the community thank you thank you last chance I forgot to mention something. oh boy <laughs> Sorry, uh, it was just uh, you know I wasn't prepared, but we we employ fifteen people. So sorry, <laughs> um, we employ fifteen people. It's just me and my wife that run our business, and uh, we have fifteen cleaners, you know, handymen, that kind of stuff that live in the community as well. And most of my people make a living wage. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, typical turnovers on Airbnbs, especially the larger ones, are anywhere from seventy-five dollars to three hundred dollars a turnover. Um, and so we obviously don't have the resources to do it ourselves. So we employ a number of people who make that amount of money. You know, they can make $600 in a day if they clean two larger properties and provide for their family. So I think that's just something that didn't get caught on it. That, and maybe we need to un understand the economic impacts of that as well. Yeah. Thank you. Something I wrote down. I'm ready to talk whenever you're ready. Can you ask a question of the group? Is that okay? I think so. Yeah, I have like a lot of things I want to say. Is there I'm going to just want to ask. So, so those of you that have short-term rentals in Woodfin, how many of you are in, um, what are the two designated? R10 or R7. R10 or R7. And all of them are in those two districts, none of the others. I have one CS. You have one where? The community shopping oh shopping oh that's yeah that's approved going forward okay just curious so so no one here is in any of the other residential districts okay I have no idea yeah, just that's yeah yeah the R, R10 or R7 has historically, like Gus said, kind oh, of it's old Whitman, mainly. been the, the, the town's allowable STR zone. So hopefully it's in that zone um, <laughs> for, you, for your sake, yes. Anybody else have anything on short-term rental before we start the discussion amongst the, the board people? And you guys are going to be able to hear that discussion, obviously, but um, we do have to close the public part of it and open it up to us so unless there's more out there I have a question uh, there was a moratorium on permits when some of my clients got properties in seven and ten and i just want to make sure that they're taking care of it. So if we're allowing permits again which it sounds like it is i'd like to make sure that we i, I don't think that's been decided is it that might be a, Sh a shannon question that's not something that we have the answer to um, is the moratorium on permitting processes still in place? I, I'm not familiar with a moratorium. <coughs> yeah. If there was one, it's not in place any longer. So a year ago when my clients bought SCRs in 7 or 10, um, when we applied for, looked look to apply for a permit, they said there was a moratorium on permits. So they didn't the larger suburbs. I'm not familiar with that. I'll have to look into it. But but we are issuing permits for short-term rentals. And I'll just reiterate, if you do not have a permit, <laughs> you need to get a permit. Um, and if you think you have a permit but you're not sure, you don't have an actual physical paper copy, call our office. We'll, we'll do our best to check the records. And if, you, if we can't find one and you can't find one, then come on in and get a permit. So. Um, I, I heard a few other questions. Would you like me to go ahead yes, please. and address some of those? Um, <clears throat> timeline for changes. This is a discussion, so no changes are being proposed. We're just formally being proposed. We're just sort of talking about what changes could look like. So the planning board needs to review some formal changes before it moves on to the town council. The town council will be the final deciding body. Um, so we will return next week, depending on how the board's deliberation goes, I would expect that we'll return next month with um, a set of standards to, for consideration. And then after that, it'll go to the Board of Commissioners, and it could spend a lot of time at the Board of Commissioners as well. They may not choose to move forward initially. It may take a little while. Um, Let's see, how many permits are issued now? I will tell you, we checked our permit system, which our modern 
permit system, which has only been placed for a little over a year, we have, what did we say, Marie? 15? We have 15 permits on record. Mm -hmm. So if you do not have a copy of your permit, and we can't find a copy of your permit, I'll say it again, come in and get a permit. Um, you should walk away when it's all done and you get granted a permit. You should have a piece of paper and you're going to want to keep that piece of paper. You're going to want to laminate it. You're going to like put it someplace safe. Um, let's see, moratorium, um, tax money, putting it back into Woodfin. Uh, I, I wish, I wish we could do that. There are two taxes that are applicable in this situation, uh, hotel, Occupancy tax, that goes to the Tourism Development Authority. We do not have access to that money. Some cities do. Some cities get a percentage of that money to reinvest back in the community. Asheville does not. And that is by state law. State, our state of North Carolina said this is how it has to happen. So um, the other tax is property tax. And you heard earlier Buncombe County is considering the possibility of taxing short-term rentals differently from a residence, something more like a bed and breakfast or some sort of commercial lodging establishment. I'm not sure how that's going to work. Um, but that, if there was a change in property tax, then that, that tax would come back into the town as part of our revenue. A portion of it. Buncombe County gets the bigger chunk. We get a little, we get a little piece. Um, why was R7 and R10 not or picked initially that is an excellent question and I have a lot of concerns I have to I'm just gonna be honest I have a lot of concerns about why R7 and R10 was picked these are our lower income modest working class historic neighborhoods R7 and R10 smaller lots smaller homes blue collar homes for the most part um, I think it is a huge equity problem, a disparity problem, that our lower income neighborhoods were targeted for short term rentals when all of the R21 big lot in our higher end subdivisions were not. That's a problem. So I just want to throw that out that, you know, I think it was probably picked because it's higher density. And I think there was a perception that that was a, um, it was more tolerable because it was higher density. The house was probably cheaper. And, yeah, and, that and about it makes those neighborhoods more vulnerable to gentrification vulnerable. because mm -hmm. people are coming in and buying them up and turning them into these short-term rentals. So um, those were all of the questions I heard. Eleanor, did you have a question for her? An answer to a question. <laughs> R7 and 10 were chosen because that's where the short-term rentals were located at the time that that group met. I guarantee if we allowed them in the other districts, they would be there too. Well, they're there. They're, yeah, they're, they're in all there. the districts. Yes. They're not just in those two by a long shot. <laughs> but I mean, that's, and that's I think. That's an assumption you're making, right? That's, why they, that's your assumption. At, no, that's, that was the fact. So I'm saying. I, that was, uh, that's what Eleanor was saying. I don't have that history, but I do think it's problematic. Um, so. I don't see that's a big percentage of people that are taking away low-income housing. It would be good for you to give the figures to Matt because Matt is looking at all the numbers and the figures and stuff because my biggest concern is there's large companies and banks that are buying up the entire neighborhoods for long-term rental and increasing the rents for low-income people can't live. So I want to be I want to be really careful because the public hearing is not open yeah. right now. So I'm just trying to respond to questions. We want to avoid yeah. trying to get into this back and forth dialogue. So, yeah. Um, but we have way more than the 15 that are permitted. Um, I would say our number is probably closer to 300. Mm -hmm. um, so most of these unpermitted, illegal. What happened to my small town? So. Also, I think maybe all the permits weren't captured originally if you only have 15, because I know oh, a lot. Oh, for sure. For yeah, sure. for yeah. sure. But, I mean, if people have a copy of their permit, great. But if you don't have a copy, come get a new permit. So um, Those are all the questions that I've heard. Okay. So. So at this time, we're going to close the public comments section of the hearing, and, and we're going to kind of discuss stuff. If we have questions for Shannon, now's your time to do it. Um, 
I have, I just have a, like several things I'm going to say respectfully. Um, I don't usually bring my personal opinions into this space. I just bring the bandwidth of knowledge that I have. Um, one of the things that I do know, um, besides being a real estate broker <laughs> and developer, um, I am a cooperative developer, which has an, a different connotation. That is about people in a workforce having ownership in their community and homes and really drive a community. One of the things, whether, Matt, it's in your reports or other reports, not to single you out, is um, it's really important to capture secondary and tertiary jobs that are long-term jobs that are created and sustained from workforce. We're talking about a groundswell in some cases, not in all cases, I recognize people are abusing this. But there is a predominant number of people in Woodfin, there aren't a lot of hotel beds, right? And so who are actually sustaining family members, not just retirements, for multiple generations because it's their way of not having people on public assistance. It's their way of bootstrapping and taking care of their own. And so in addition to providing in our own home, you know, what are the ancillary, ancillary um, secondary, tertiary, whatever effects and impacts of community-based lodging? And, and I just want to say this. I, I was making some notes as everyone was talking. And thank you all for your comments. Whatever your stance is, I appreciate you coming today, showing up and being here for such a long time. So I'll be brief. Um, is there a way to limit absentee ownership? Is there, I, I noticed, I'm not questioning uh, your recommendations because you're excellent at what you do. I, in my perspective, I thought, we're really, really hunkering down on individual owner use. What if we looked at it from, if you don't live within a certain radius of the address, you don't get to do it. You know, what about another layer and level of accountability? I'm not saying my answers are correct either, but uh, what I am proposing is we, this community, the people who live here, are really based in just working, going to work every day, raising their family, you know, going to the hospital, paying the hospital bill, you know, making the payments, and to see a level of community income for those who live here go away, is there a way to re rethink this in a cooperative economic development where it's literally, if you don't live here, you don't have the accountability, you're not paying a fee that's associated with your permit or whatever that goes back into the community, then good luck. Because it opens the door, mm -hmm. you know, we have four generations in my house. And I was, I have a permit, maybe you both don't have it, but I was going to start uh, a short-term rental, but now I've got to rethink it because we're out of bedrooms. But it isn't just for the, the oldest generation in my house. My husband and I are real estate brokers, and we have two children who we love and we adopted. So how the heck is the average person in Woodfin who works every day supposed to earn an honest living outside of an income that isn't hurting anyone. And so I just want to recommend, I think your, the recommendations of the entire staff here are phenomenal. I want to ask if we could stretch ourselves and think about it from a community economic developed framework that says this is what we can do differently because we're Woodfin. We are workers, we are workforce, and we can build the economic engine that needed um, in a framework that doesn't extract or exploit. And I know that your recommendations are doing that. In my mind, though, there's a couple of gaps that say, wow, people could get injured long term by not being able to do this. So I, I have some more specific things I'd love to you know, schedule a meeting and maybe sit down and talk about. But I really appreciate what everyone's brought, but especially through your leadership as a staff and team. I, I do have concerns long term that it's going to restrict the very people who pay their taxes, show up, go to the schools, volunteer the hours, are going are, are gonna to be, um, have to migrate over time. So thank you. 
Um, I, I want to say that I support the staff's recommendation. Uh, I believe in neighborhoods, and I think Woodfin's never going to be the town that it needs to be if we don't strengthen neighborhoods. And I'm sorry for those of you in the audience that are short-term rentals, but they don't strengthen neighborhoods. You can't knock on a door and talk to the people that live there. They're not supporting the schools. The kids that come out to play, there's no playmates in that house. Not that everybody has kids, but it, it, I'm, I just don't think it works except in certain areas. And I don't think we, we uh, continue with the older sections of Woodfin. I really think it's been very unfair that they've been targeted for short-term rentals. Not that neighborhoods like mine don't have them too, even though it's not even approved. So I support the town. I mean, I support the our t town manager. One last thing, um, thank you. I, one last thing I didn't mention is, what about the timing of this? One of the things I wrote down is, with the increase in interest rates and affordable housing being at the forefront of so much of what we're talking about, I understand that those who are exploiting the problem, there needs to be something implemented to stop it. And the counterbalance of that is the rush to do it could really choke off maybe what some people need. And I'm wondering like if there's if there's a some kind of survey or some kind of collective information or partnering with people who have information could kind of think about the timing of it all so it doesn't kind of create this cataclysmic um, problem that was wasn't accounted for. Um, yeah, I think, I think timing, I, th I think there's a balance to the timing. I think absolutely there are problems and what other problems could be created if it was done too hastily? Well, don't you think by allowing a couple of years, you are allowing, you know, a time for people to adjust? Well, it's, uh, I think doing something all at once has has uh, other issues. Um, as a person who's grown up in neighborhoods of working class people in poorer neighborhoods myself, um, never lived in a wealthy uh, environment, I know what it's like to be gentrified. My generation, my family, my ancestors know. So from a perspective of wanting to build for the future and having access to that and having that being taken away because people who have don't want that, there's a balance in that. I think it doesn't have to be this or that. There's a way where everyone can come together and figure it out so it's not exploitive for anyone. And that's my primary concern is I don't live in a four bedroom house, but I could, see, but we need a four bedroom house, right? Because we have too many people in our three-bedroom house, and we're okay with that. But what if we did? Then would we be limited to, to actually make a better life for our family? I just, it's a very personal matter that I think everyone in this room has expressed, I, I have, whether it's from a real estate perspective or a lived experience. I just, sometimes when we rush, it's a sign of privilege, and it actually does more harm in the end. And I and I I know I'm in like the wrong room to say that. And at the same time I have to say it because it's what I know to represent. Thank you for listening. No, I sympathize with uh, the lady that's a resident on Audubon Drive. Because I know that we've been called up to those parties. No matter how they're managed, people like to do things when people turn their backs, just like kids. So you can manage them. You can do this. You can say no parties. You can say none of this. It's going to happen. We've seen it. I've seen it in my line of work. So I sympathize with you because we've been we've been at that road before. So and I also sympathize with the ones that do manage the property right. And I do think that this needs to be looked at a little bit more, but I also believe that this is not the Woodfin I grew up in anymore. And I have to come to terms with that. 53 years ago, I was born here. 
So I'm still here. I love this town. But it's changing to more of a, to me, more of a rental town than more permanent residents. That's how I feel with apartments here, this here, this here. So there's got to be some kind of in between. So that's just what I'll say. Awesome. <laughs> Well, j just for the record, because I haven't spoken yet, um, I am also a realtor in the local market. So I, I too, do too um, have clients that are very concerned about this particular issue and how it is going to be moving forward and um, what are they going to do with what was their investment last year and, and how are you going to make that if we use an amortization or whatever, how are you going to make that right over the next five years when I was planning for that to be right in 20 years or 15 years, whatever that, that holding time was. Um, I also too believe that there is a happy medium. Uh, I believe that two sides can come together and with, with willing minds, um, you, you can hear both sides of it. I, I have an Airbnb that is right behind me. Um, and when they opened up, I was under the impression that it was gonna be the absolute worst thing to my neighborhood, to, to my little section. And I did not wait. I walked right to the guy who bought it the very first day he was mowing the grass. And I said, hey, look, you've moved this Airbnb into a very res residential neighborhood with some small kids. Uh, we like to get out and we like to have a good time. Understand this, if the sun goes down and you are very loud, I am gonna call you. And if you don't answer, I am gonna call the police and then they will help me figure out your situation. Five years now, I've not had one, you know, run in with this. Bachelorette party after bachelorette party after bachelorette party. Hooting and hollering during the day is awesome. Enjoy Asheville. Enjoy Woodfin. But I do have a problem with some of these, you know, areas that shouldn't have been Airbnbs, whether it's a, a small subdivision where the, the covenants or, or the, the restrictions have gone away and then all of a sudden you're, you're moving short-term rentals into these things. Um, but I do believe in people's money being their investments. And if, if it is legal and permitted in a proper channel and, and maintained, then they should have the ability to do that as well. But I also, again, I'm, I'm a person that I like to meet the minds. I think that there is a way for everybody to win in this situation. Um, I am 100% on the, the, the bandwagon that this needs more than one meeting. Uh, and, and I'm counting the, the town of Woodfin meeting at the, the town hall or at the community center. Uh, it was quoted in the paper that it was 60 people, 50 to 60 people that were there and spoke. If that is the number, I'm going on the large side, 60 people, that is less than 1% of the town of Woodfin. It's 2020 census number. And we can all guess how that number is. Um, so my, my recommendation is uh, I love the task force idea that was brought up. Um, whether we have a, a person from the Board of Commissioners on that as the lead or a person from this board on that as the lead and then comprise it of town members. Um, I just don't think that 60 people at a five o'clock work session is enough to, to make a decision. Yeah. So that is my point of view. Anybody else got any comments? Does anybody want to vote on it tonight? I have to we're not give, supposed I, I to vote. I don't think we're I think this is a work session. I, I have to give you the option. Yeah. But we can say no. If um, we don't have enough, then we, we just say no. Um, well, I've already made my position yeah. clear. So. Yeah, no, it's fine. I, and I, I, well, it's probably two and two <laughs> based on what Jeff said, but maybe not. I don't know. Yeah, Jeff. I mean, we. I was going to say, at some point, we're going to need direction on what kind of standards to come forward with. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think, and don't, don't take me wrong, Shannon, I think the standards are an awesome idea. Mm -hmm. yeah, I do think that the issue with standards is, uh, and this is just look in hindsight, Asheville doesn't do a really good job of controlling their Airbnbs. You know, there's an illegal Airbnb around every corner in, in the in city Asheville. of Asheville. Is it? <laughs> I mean, yeah. there are, there just are. It's so hard to enforce it. The enforcement is yeah. really, really challenging. So um, it's like, I love the standards idea, and I, I love 
yeah. kind of limiting it some. I have a question based on the current ordinance that ha was approved a long time ago. Is there going to be an attempt to enforce it in the areas that are currently not supposed to have them? We do enforce it. Um, the problem is you can't, you have to, in order for us to enforce it, we have to match a listing with a physical address. And if you look at an Airbnb listing, you do not have identifying features. It's not like I can go down, it's not like I can look at the listing and say, oh yeah, that's, you know, 29 L. give you like a half mile radius or something. Right. So you have to match it. So we get a complaint about a particular piece of property, but then we have to find the listing. We, have, we either have to find the listing to document that people have rented it, or we have to talk to a renter and get firsthand confirmation that they're renters, they're short term. That's very difficult to do. We don't have nighttime enforcement. We don't have weekend enforcement. That's not right. something a small town can afford. We cannot send our police force to these. This is, that is not the right use of emergency um, personnel. Um, so it is a very difficult thing to enforce. You can if you get that proof, but that proof's hard to obtain. Now, there are software platforms or software companies that specialize in this. They, they go on the sites, they crawl around the sites, they find identifying features, they match it to property card listings. It's an expensive service and it's proprietary, so they will only give you data as long as you're subscribing to their service. Um, so that, I mean, that is something we could do, but for 300 units, you know, I don't know if that, that really pencils out. Um, could neighborhoods help? It has to be, so you, in order to do zoning enforcement, you have to be a certified zoning official and you have oh. to have. Well, we just find the addresses. Well, we, I yeah. Rent, we, I want to rent your Airbnb. Well, you have to find, we know the addresses. We get calls about them. We know the addresses. <laughs> Um, we can't find the listing. We have to have proof that that okay. illegal is happening, that activity is happening. So we either do that by matching the listing or by making contact. And if we, you know, you the neighbor might make contact, but our staff That's have to. That's what I'm saying. I could make the contact. We have to, it has to be firsthand information. It cannot I, be hearsay. I can't tell you where it is. You can tell us, but we have to collect that. What, she, what she's saying is if you tell her and she goes there and nothing's going on, or, then she can't do anything. It's much right. like if you call about a dog barking. The dog's barking excessively, the animal control comes and the dog's not barking anymore, they're just going to say, they're going to go. Yeah, <laughs> they're out yeah, of there. Same. Can't do anything. Um, I do have some concern. I, I love the idea of additional discussion. I have no problems with that. I do have some concern about a task force. This is a polarizing issue. It's, it, you're either for it or you're against it. Um, and it's very difficult to get reasonable minds together and find, find regulations. Um, appointing people to that task force becomes very challenging. No more than one realtor. Yeah. Um, I mean, and that's, that's totally fine. I mean, it, it, I think that, and I think the task force should be totally encompassing of the town. Yeah, you know? yeah I agree. I one agree. person from Reynolds Village, one person from the Mill Village, one person from Richmond Hill, you know, whatever our little neighborhoods are, and it's just, it's a task force to be like, what is the mindset of my community? You know, like my little community back here off of my little road. I'm not going to tell you all where I live. <laughs> off of my little road. It's my community. I, I am invested in that community. I have been for 17 years and I plan to be for the next 25. Um, it's it's going gonna, it's it's, gonna to be very difficult to keep it, it balanced. Um, even if you had, it's difficult to define where one neighborhood begins and another one ends. Um, and even within those neighborhoods you're gonna people are gonna come in with their opinions um i i don't think that that means that we can't find some some common ground or some reasonable options that work for the greatest percentage of people i do think that that's possible um i and i'm not saying no to a task force but i just i have some concerns <laughs> Do you think, uh, this is again a wild idea, but that's what I'm good at is coming up with out of the box ideas. Like, um, not that there's a punitive measure at this moment, but an amnesty day, for lack of a better term, where anybody and everybody who has a short term rental, not to overwhelm staff, whatever the process is, can come and re register because it sounds like they're not all read, read in the file of registry anyway, and or a week or a month or whatever. and kind of figure out where everything is just by self-reporting and then decide 
what the next steps are in terms of scaling into the process. If you're operating illegally, you're not going to disclose that you're operating illegally. <laughs> I mean, you're not going to yeah. come. If you do an amnesty with the intent that later we're going to go back and regulate you, nobody's going to come forward. So, no, that's not, that's actually not what I'm saying. I'm not saying that you go. I'm not suggesting we go backwards and be punitive. I'm saying that there's obviously lots of information that's missing, and if we collect more of what's missing, as we're well, processing how to move forward. It's a combination of things that are happening. Well, that data would be wonderful. I, I don't think we're going to get it from no. people I, who are renting. From my neighborhood, you don't know they're, not gonna they're not going to come and register. <laughs> yeah. Um, and and just, just want to avoid any of the uh, uh, hot button words. We're not registering anybody. It's not a registration. <laughs> yeah. We just need a permit. All right, not register. We just need a permit. And we have months before any if there are going to be changes, that we have months before these changes are going to happen, so people have plenty of time to get that permit if they don't have it right now. I think the word is out. I mean, can we do can we do something where you know we do a, an expediated kind of? I know we want to go slow, but let's say we do one little town hall meeting once a week for a month and a half or two months, and if you can't make it to every one of them, awesome. But if you can make it to one of those in there, and you can voice your opinion. I think that would add the number of opinions and viewpoints and things like that to it and still keep it moving on a fast enough track. But I'm not prepared to vote tonight, so I'm already going to vote to push it off another month, you know, to the, to the next session. So that's four more weeks. I feel like if, if we could put something on the town's web page that said, hey, if you guys, we've got 35 people in here tonight. We had 60 at the, the one that they did at the community center. If we can do 60 people once a week and, and kind of get a nice... It is really difficult to get people to turn out in those kind of numbers. Uh, even Throw over... short-term rental out and look what we got. Yeah, in all the realtors. <laughs> but you don't know if you don't ask. You don't know if you, but you don't know if you don't ask and you're, we're taking away... I, I, I'm really big on um, not overly deciding for other people. And when we don't give people the option in multiple formats, you know, not just the same time every time, we're unintentionally excluding people. And so I can appreciate that some people don't show up, and this could be for very valid reasons. But if we don't give people the opportunity to give their voice, I mean, that's part of what being a community is, and give them the time to do that, then we're just deciding for other people. Be nice if we could do a referendum. What if they could come in and actually vote? If you told them that they could come and vote for or against, mm -hmm. and they had to give their name and address, and they had to live in Woodfin. You say election, they'll go. I'm into that. <laughs> anything just to hear from that, people. That wouldn't require a task force or anything. You'd just say you have an opportunity to express. I mean, I have no idea how that would turn out. But <laughs> I, yeah, I'm not sure. I think there might be some logistical challenges to that, but also some... It's too bad I, we're I not on the ballot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is there something where you could do as a, as a town, and South Carolina does this on a state level, whereas if you're, you're not a, a permanent residence, it's one tax bracket for property tax, and if you are a permanent residence, it's a lower mm -hmm. tax bracket. For instance, the numbers are four and six. Yeah, that, that's that something all... that you could break down in just like a wood fin no. Okay. Yeah, that is definitely established by the state tax law. Even for this, like the Woodfin tax that's on our tax bill? I'm just, again, throwing yes. out. Okay. Yes? What about just SDR permit fees, annual reoccurring fees? We just specifically focused towards the coffers of the town of Woodfin. So permit fees do come back to the town, but um, they're, again, so if you're not familiar with North Carolina, uh, government, like how it works, but all of the municipality's authority is granted to us by the state. So um, the state basically establishes the rules or the parameters under which we can operate. And the state has said, you can charge permit fees, but it's cost recovery. So it's what it costs us to actually physically review and enter your permit into the system, paying somebody $23 an hour, whatever it is they're going to pay. <laughs> It, yeah, it won't. It doesn't work that way. So now, now we can add enforcement. You know, if it's going to cost us 
if we can come up with a number that says enforcement costs us this much a year and so we have to do cost recovery but we only have 300 permits i mean that's a really expensive yeah. permit um so uh, yeah it's it it's something to be considered it could help but probably marginally right. one other thing i was thinking of i mean if we have 300 units let's just say registered permitted units within the entire population of both things, and we put it to a vote you know i would guess that of those 300 most people are working class it's not the investors right so i don't mean to cut you off but yeah. this isn't an open dialogue so this is a public sure. hearing the public hearing has been closed yeah. Yeah. we're <laughs> sorry having a conversation amongst our yeah it it happens at town council too. Yeah. We need to. We need to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we just all get excited about some stuff. So we can talk after. I'll, I'll stick around. Anybody has questions? I'd be happy to talk with you. So, so I I really appreciate um, everything you're saying. I'm going to say one more time. I I have extensive experience and background in cooperative development, and there are towns in the world, in the in in you know Spain and other places, um, in the United States where. It might be this tiny municipality, but it's all about the people who live there and work there owning everything and developing fees around their ownership and their lifestyle needs. So in my mind, as we think about a comprehensive plan and the future of Woodfin, and we're kind of preempting that with this, this need to move forward, you know, is it possible to think about what this looks like as a part of the comprehensive plan and really I mean there are some cities and communities out there in this world that it is all about the people who live and work there and they are thriving because they've changed the model on the things that weren't working to benefit the community itself and I'm just putting it out there because it's one of the towns that we have in Buncombe County which is like none right we're the one we're one of the one of the ones that have the opportunity to do what we're supposed to do as a town municipality you know equipped by the state of north carolina and also do it the way we need as the citizens and the community members here and so i just i know maybe other people can't see it but i've seen it i've been there i've done that i've i've seen it in many different communities and it works when there's a problem and it gets solved economically to benefit the community, it works. So it sounds, so one thing that seems clear, uh, I mean, we have a couple board members who are interested in moving forward with regulations, at least at some point, but it um, sounds like we, we're not prepared to, to vote tonight anyway. So I would maybe recommend that we return next month with at least some additional thoughts on how to engage the community further. Um, and we need Dylan to be here. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I, think, I don't think I'm, I mean, I think it would be premature at this point to start to craft regulations, so we'll just um, put it on the back burner for now. Thank you for an extra long day. No, it's been oh. a long day for you. Okay. Anybody got anything else to say, Shannon? No, but thank you for your hard work. Yeah, thank you so much. Well, awesome. So what what we will do is is we will move this. We will discuss this further at the next session too. I do want to say, guys, thanks for coming out and being part of of the town hall or the board of uh, planning and zoning. <laughs> We're going to become the commissioner soon. Just just a note. I'm not a realtor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. There's two of us. Uh, this meeting is adjourned. Very easy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. You all too. Just, just.